Our speaker is just getting up. Unfortunately, Dr. Philpott's not able to join us, but she's joining us on by Zoom here, and we're just getting the details sorted out here. So I think I'll go ahead and make the introductions. We're going to have some time after the, after Dr. Philpott speaks before Dr. Simpson gives his lectureship. So I'll have another opportunity to have some snacks. So I know Dr. Jane Philpott needs no introductions. As Dean of Queen's Health Sciences and Director of the School of Medicine, and also notably, she was the 2016 Sinclair lecture, her, lecture during her tenure as Canada's Health Minister. So we have just heard a lot about the challenges with health human resources. Challenges with supply, retention, governance. Dr. Philpott will speak today about the role of education. So the supply side of health human resource equation. And more specifically, thinking about innovative education models and policies that explore how we might train differently to build stronger healthcare teams, to address community workforce needs, and facilitate access to services. All of those we just heard are in dire need. So, hi Dr. Philpot, nice to see you today. <laughs> so Jane, if you could look out in the audience, you'd see a whole bunch of people here look today in this beautiful environment, and we're just looking at yourself and also the beautiful uh, water out in front of us as well. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to you and then we'll have time at the end for questions. Thanks very much, Catherine, and hello to everyone. I really wish that I were there with you in person, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, I've decided that it is better for me to connect with you remotely today as I deliver my remarks, but I have been with you all along and intend to stay uh, through the rest of the symposium. Uh, let me start by congratulating the organizers of the event on putting on a really fantastic symposium uh, to align itself with the 2022 Sinclair Lecture. And you've chosen a very important topic. We've had some great uh, interventions so far this afternoon, and of course, more great ideas to come with Dr. Chris Simpson this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to that. I'd like to think that my comments to you today are going to be on the hopeful side of the story. So we've heard uh, some fairly discouraging news about the state of affairs is as it pertains to health care, health systems, and health outcomes, both in our community, across our province, and across Canada. And I'm going to come with what I hope will be a little bit more positive spin on what the possibilities are. Now, Catherine's told you a little bit about my background, uh, some of which is fairly well known to you, both uh, from my role as Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences and CEO of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization, as well as my time in politics, uh, including the time as Minister of Health. I would say, actually, the things that I'm going to share with you today uh, come from uh much more on the ground realities. And Don referred to this in his comments. It's really on the front lines of care that we often learn the most. So I'm coming to you as a family doctor, as somebody who spent decades working on the front lines of care, including in one of the poorest countries in the world, in Niger, where people live on less than $2 a day per person in the entire country. Uh, and if you can deliver a healthcare system in the poorest country in the world, uh, you start to learn a little bit about how to make do with limited resources. Of course, limited resources are a reality for all of us. We've never experienced such a limitation in our health human resources as we have in recent times, but I absolutely believe that there are great solutions available to us. One of the good news stories that I want you to think about is that most of you are connected somehow to Queen's and specifically to Queen's Health Sciences. And at a time where health human resources are one of our most dire needs across the province and beyond, the good news is that we are in the business of creating health human resources, not all of them, but a very uh, significant chunk of health human resources. That is the business we are in. We are also in the business of discovery of health research, of answering uh, the most important questions in health, including the important work that people like Catherine Donnelly do in health services and health policy, where we are asking those important questions and putting answers out. 
But today I'm going to talk a lot about our education part of our mandate and what we can do in that area. The incentives, it's already been said, have never been more powerful. We aren't going to let this crisis go to waste. And it's absolutely essential that we don't. There's no question that this matters to governments and policymakers. Most provinces in the country now spend 40 or 50 percent of their budget on health. So we hope that they are listening. In fact, we know that they are listening and looking for solutions. And I'm going to propose to you today some of the things that people in this room, the room that you're in, are working on as just some examples of why we have reason to hope and why we need to keep moving forward in a positive light. I'm going to tell you about four specific things that we're doing at Queen's Health Sciences, which I think are uh, incredibly important. Uh, The first uh, two of them have to do largely with this issue of access to primary care. And when I say primary care, I mean uh, a broad swath of providers. It's most often discussed in terms of lack of access to family doctors. And I will talk about that, but it's all linked to the breadth of providers in primary care. So the the first two examples are in that uh, field. The third example is uh, a a story about an expanding partnership with Indigenous communities who have been long associated with the Queen's family. And the fourth is a bit more of a big picture thing in terms of what we're doing at Queen's Health Sciences in our approach to radical collaboration, uh, which is something that I know you've already talked about a bit about today. So let me get started with these. Um, Let's think about uh, access to family doctors and primary care. We know, because this research has been done for decades, we know that countries or regions who have put a focus on primary care get the best health outcomes at the lowest costs in a way that is both equitable and accessible. Canada has not, to the extent possible, based its system on primary care, and I think we need to continue to push for that to be a reality. What we're doing now doesn't work. We've already talked, I think this afternoon, you've talked about uh, when it comes to doctors, the low numbers of physicians that are choosing family medicine as a specialty area. In fact, the numbers that I'm going to quote to you are even worse than what Dawn said in that in our most recent graduating class across the country, only 31% of medical students graduating chose family medicine as their specialty area. So there must be something we're doing in the way that we train doctors right now that is not encouraging them to go into family medicine to the extent that we'd like to see, and that would be more in the order of 50%. But in addition to that, even of those who graduate from a family medicine training program, very small numbers are choosing to go into practice. In fact, Ontario Health did a study this year suggesting that of those who are finishing family medicine residency programs, only 15%, that's one five percent of graduating family doctors are choosing to either join or start a comprehensive community practice. Most of them are going into focus practice, doing locums, doing additional training, for example. And we're hearing of certain programs in the country where actually none of the graduates of the family medicine programs are actually going out to start up a practice. So what's behind that and what can we do to make it better? That's where we come along with some solutions. So the first one is a project that we're working on that addresses the issue of why don't medical students choose to go into family medicine? And we've been doing a fair bit of thinking about that. And in this case, we had the stars align in a rather uh, helpful way in order for us to, to put forward a project, which we're very excited about. One of the things that happened was that we were approached by our colleagues in Lake Ridge Health to say that they would like to partner with us in a more substantial way. Most of you know that Lake Ridge Health is in the Durham region of Ontario, east of Toronto. We have sent learners there for years. In fact, we have uh, things like a longitudinal integrated clerkship in our medical school program based at Lake Ridge, uh, where we have uh, medical students there. We also have uh, family medicine residents who spend time in that area, in the Oshawa and Bowmanville area. But Lake Ridge Health came to us and said, we'd like to do more than that. In fact, they had a little bit of a nudge from the other side in that they were being approached as well by the University of Toronto, who is building a new medical school campus in Scarborough, and saying, we'd like to partner with you, Lake Ridge. We'd like to send our learners from our new U of T campus in Scarborough out to Lake Ridge. 
I'm very happy to say that Lake Ridge enjoys their partnership with Queens and they said, we'd like to talk to you first. We've had a good longstanding relationship with you. We'd let, what more could we do? Could we in fact build a satellite campus in Lake Ridge Health? And we began to put our heads together to think about what was possible in that area. The other fortuitous thing that happened aligned with that is that after a fair bit of advocacy from the faculties of medicine across the province, the province decided this year to announce that they are expanding the number of seats in medical school, both in the MD program, the undergraduate medical education, as well as in their residency programs. And Queen's was given 20 new seats in the MD program and 30 new residency positions. So we thought, aha, let's use these 20 new seats and use them with the partnership with Lake Ridge that we'd like to build on. A third fortuitous thing happened, and that is that we had a very helpful person come become available to us with a little bit of extra time on his hands, and that's Dr. Tony Sanfilippo. Tony's probably known to many of you in the room. He's been the Associate Dean of our MD program for 15 years now, knows more about MD education than than almost anybody in the country, I'd like to argue, and has run a fantastic program for us here at Queen's. He's decided, he decided to step down from that. We've recruited a wonderful new associate dean for our MD program, Dr. Gina Piliotis. And so Tony said, you know what, I've got a bit of time on my hands, and I wonder if there's a way for me to use some of the things I've been thinking about. And one of the things he'd been thinking about was the way that we train medical students and why over time have less and less of them chosen to go into family medicine. Tony's been thinking about that as I have probably many of you in the room. And some of the things that he talked about were the fact that an enormous amount of our curriculum in that MD program is devoted to giving medical students uh, a view of the entire array of medical specialties. There are now at least 30 broad categories of specialty that those medical students can choose when they graduate. And within that, there are dozens more of subspecialty areas. And in fact, those students spend a lot of time exploring that whole range of specialties. And so some of them may start medical school with the idea that they would like to be family doctors, but after a while, they start to get other ideas and they start to see some of these other uh, areas of specialization. I like to think that they start to realize how hard family medicine is. And for a whole variety of reasons, less and less of them have chosen family medicine over time. So what was the idea Tony had? Tony said, what if we pre-selected entrance to medical school, those students who are committed to comprehensive community-based general practice or family medicine. Uh, and what if we put them into a curriculum that was deeply embedded in communities where we showed them the wonderful things that happen in a family medicine career and made sure that they were taught well, that whole comprehensive spectrum of skills, knowledge, and attitude that they need to have to become great family doctors. And what if we took out of the curriculum all of that time that they had to do on career planning and trying to decide which specialty they wanted to be and instead wove this into a seamless program where they would go from three years of an um, MD program right through to family medicine residency program and for that entire time that they would be embedded in communities. That's pretty much what we've decided to do. And uh, several of you have been involved in this. We think it's a really exciting solution. We're not the first in the world to have done this, but we will be the first in Canada to have done this. So Tony and the team have been working along with family medicine colleagues across uh, the province. And in fact, across the country, we've gone to folks like Ruth Wilson, uh, who is known to some of you, who's now working largely up in Northwest Territories, trying to get the best and brightest minds in terms of how do we train uh, family medicine specialists even better. And uh, we look forward to seeing this happen. Some of us are going to be involved later in the week in a summit where we are going to be looking at uh, the curriculum approach, a new approach to admissions. How do you actually detect who will be a family doctor who is dedicated to comprehensive practice right from the very start? Uh, what does it look like to truly embed those students in communities who will adopt them and make them feel at home so that hopefully they will stay in those communities? And how do we attract 
attract great uh, community preceptors to be able to work with those students. So uh, that is our Lake Ridge Health Partnership, and I'd be happy to answer some questions about that as we go along. I think it's a really exciting opportunity, and hopefully uh, we'll demonstrate that there are new and better ways that we can train uh, family physicians uh, to serve our communities. The second project I want to tell you about uh, is related to the question of why don't family doctors who have been trained as such choose to go into practice after they finish their training program? And there's been a fair bit of work done about this, and there is a range of answers to the question. Some of it is related to the very high administrative burden that you've heard others talk about, where family doctors are spending a lot of time doing things that you don't need to be a doctor to do, uh, and that leads often to burnout. We're also seeing that the lifestyle uh, that uh, residents are seeing is not appealing. There's very little control over the lifestyle. I can tell you that from having been a family doctor myself, but also having lots of friends uh, and family who are in family medicine. Uh, in this time of very difficult challenges, uh, it's hard for people to get away. Um, I have uh, hear of people going on canoe trips and still having to check back on their, their uh, medical records of their patients because because they simply can't find someone to sign out to. So some of the lifestyle choices are, are really challenging. But the other part of the primary care system that we've been really trying to look at here is how do we build a primary care uh climate that actually addresses population health. And here I want to get back to some of the ideas that uh, uh, Duncan and Dawn and Joan talked about earlier. Um, and there really are some solutions for how we can do better on primary care in order to make sure that population health and access to care are priorities. This project is called the Periwinkle Health Home. So it might be the first time you've ever heard of this and you'll say, what on earth is she talking about? The Periwinkle Health Home, you heard, heard about it first here. It's a model that uh, we hope will take hold and perhaps be re reproduced elsewhere. Where did we get such a name? It's inspired by the Periwinkle Flower, which is a five-petaled flower. And when you think Periwinkle, you should think of five things. Those are the five things that are part of the quintuple aim. And if you've been involved at all in thinking about healthcare improvement, you know that we used to talk about a triple aim in healthcare, and then we went to a quadruple aim in healthcare. And finally, now we've landed on a quintuple aim, five things that those of us in health systems are needing to keep on the top of our minds. What are the five things? Number one, population health. Number two, better care. Number three, happy providers, really important. Number four, value for money. And number five, fairness or equity. So those five pieces of the, the quintuple aim have been uh, symbolized in the Periwinkle Health Home. And we are hoping to launch this right here in Kingston in working in partnership with the Frontenac, Lennox and Addington Ontario Health Team in the coming months if we get the support which we have asked for. So why would Queen's Health Sciences be involved in this? Why would SEMO be involved in this? This is because it actually takes all of us working together to be able to find these solutions in health systems. And so uh, we are delighted. I can say I am delighted on behalf of Queen's Health Sciences and CMO to have gathered with a very broad spectrum of partners across the health systems here in the region. That includes, of course, our great leadership at the Ontario Health Team and the Frontenac Lennox and Addington OHT. It includes a really great partnership with the Kingston Community Health Centre, the CHC, both local hospitals, Providence Care and Kingston Health Sciences Centre, as well as the Lennox and Addington County General Hospital are involved in this. Uh, and public health is stepping up to the table as well. And all of us have put our heads together to design what we believe is a great option for primary care that will actually get at the fact that people don't have access to care, that our emergency departments are overburdened, that people are having excessive lengths of stay in hospital because they can't be discharged to primary care. And because, and, and in addition, we're seeing uh, significant numbers of patients who are uh, taking up uh, using beds that are an uh, alternate level of care beds. So how is this going to be different than what we already have now? 
Here's where my background in family medicine is very helpful. I do remember the day and I practiced in the day when we worked under fee for service, when we were, as Dawn said, driven by volume. You make more money if you see more patients. That means if your pr- patient has blood pressure, you can invite them to come back every month. There's a, a, a number of perverse incentives that are built into fee for service systems. Then about 20 years ago, in the early part of the turn of the millennia, the province came up with something called primary care reform, and they began to move to a system where family doctors were encouraged to roster patients or to to develop a panel of patients. And so you were then paid according to these capitation models and the number of patients, you were to sign up a number of patients and you were to be the primary care provider for those patients. Those rosters vary anywhere now from about 800 persons per provider up to as high as 3,000 people. All seemed really like a great idea. So you wouldn't be incentivized to necessarily over provide, but you would commit to taking care of those people. It hasn't worked as well as we would have hoped. I was a proponent of primary care reform and capitation models 20 years ago. I've seen that it has had some unintended, uh, uh, unhelpful outcomes. One of which is the fact that uh, human beings as they are, uh, some will sign up large volumes of patients and not necessarily provide the kind of access that's necessary uh, for a whole range of reasons. Uh, And the disincentives in that system, again, going back to Don's comments about disincentives, the disincentives are not as great as you'd think they would be uh, for people not providing care to the patients that they have. But it's had a more subtle effect on family doctors, and that is the fact that you then have a a population of patients, say it's 1,200, 1,500 patients for whom you have to provide care. The other partners in your practice might have their own group of 1,200 or 1,500. Unfortunately, there's nothing in that system that incents you or encourages you to think about the health of the population, what the group that we call the unattached patients in the system. And so over time, very large numbers of unattached patients have uh, have grown. And as has been said now, we have large numbers of people in the province and across the country who don't have access to a primary care provider. Um, and uh, we believe that there, there's work to be done in that area. We know that in the Kingston area, we have about 20,000 people who don't have access to primary care. It's a little bit higher than the provincial average. And it does have a knock-on effect in the rest of the health system. So what are we going to do in the periwinkle health home? We're going to take the best of all the models that are out there. And one of the interesting things uh, about some of these models is that those like the community health center are based on a salary so that doctors are paid for the amount of time they work and that they often have better access to administrative supports and to an interdisciplinary team. And so we are proposing that the Periwinkle Health Home, uh, which we hope will be open um, not too far away from where you all are now, the current proposed site is uh, at the same site where the field hospital uh, was going to be that was never used on Union Street. Street, that this would be a facility that would be open seven days a week, 12 hours a day, where doctors would work. But here's where it gets really good. You don't need just family doctors to run a primary care system. You need the entire scope of practitioners. And we know that we have had, for example, nurse practitioner-led clinics, which have been extremely successful, but have not linked uh, with family medicine-led clinics. At the Periwinkle Health Home, everybody is a part of the team. Uh, Everybody is an equally important player from the family doctor to the nurse practitioner to the registered nurse to the social worker, the dietitian, uh, the occupational therapist, and the whole team. Uh, Because as you've already heard from others, uh, we need to make sure that everybody is working to their full scope and that we share tasks across the team and the pers- and a, a, a patient or a person is seen by the most uh, appropriate provider at the appropriate time. So uh, one of the, now you might say, well, isn't that just a walk-in clinic? Um, it's not just a walk-in clinic. This is a permanent health home for these patients, uh, for the 10,000 patients that it will, it will uh, provide care to, to start up. Uh, and they will be seen by uh Uh, whichever provider is the right person for them at the time that they show up in the clinic. 
Um, we're excited about uh, how this might be able to provide a solution. And uh, you might say, well, where are you going to get the family doctors? Because they simply don't exist. We think that some of those new graduates who don't want to join a practice because they don't want to be on call 52 weeks of the year, 365 days of the year, and would like to be able to sign out periodically, um, will be attracted to a model like this. That's certainly what they've said in some of the studies and research that's been done very recently. The other group we're really hoping to attract back into the system is a huge number of providers, and these may be nurse practitioners, they may be family doctors who have recently retired. We know family doctors often retire early than, earlier than the average retirement age for a number of reasons, but one of them is because they do have these very large rosters. They can't necessarily take a week or two or four off in a certain time of the year to be able to get away. And if we can offer a system where they can work a certain number of weeks per year or a certain number of days per week, um, we believe that they will be much more attracted to that. So stay tuned uh, to news about the uh, this very exciting proposal for an integrated access to universal interdisciplinary primary care. Okay, I'm going to pause in a few minutes to give you time to give me feedback and questions, but I want to tell you about two other things that we're working on. The third one uh, is the uh, project that we have developed around uh, working with partners in Winnebago area. So those of you who have been around Queen's long enough, especially Queen's Health Sciences, will know that we have a very long-standing relationship with Moose Factory Hospital. And uh, this actually goes back to 1965 when there was an agreement between the federal government and Queen's University to provide Ser physician services largely in at Moose Factory Hospital. That relationship has uh, developed, expanded, flourished, built trust so that there has been a partnership between both Queens and the Kingston region in general and Moose Factory plus all of the communities along the James Bay Coast. It includes communities like Attawapiskat, Keshechewan, Fort Albany, Piawanek. They all form an organization called the Winnebago Area Health Authority. This has largely been a clinical partnership to date. Doctors and nurses from Queens and Kingston have gone to work at Moose Factory Hospital uh, periodically, some staying for a very long time, some returning dozens of times. Uh, we also, as you may know, uh, we are the, the key uh, number one referral center for patients from Moose Factory Hospital who need more advanced care. Uh, they are, are come down to Kingston on a regular basis, stay in our community, uh, and get their access to care uh, here in, in Kingston hospitals. So that's been a great relationship. It means that those communities trust uh, Queens and Kingston, and we have been looking at how we could expand that into an educational partnership. You are probably all well, well aware of the fact that Indigenous uh peoples are underrepresented in health systems. This has all sorts of effects, including um, anti-Indigenous racism in the health system. Uh, and uh, we have all been working hard in recent years to be able to attract a more diverse student and faculty population uh, in, our, in our health sciences faculties. Still largely the students, the Indigenous students that get attracted to our programs tend to be from more Southern communities, tend to be from more urban communities communities. It's actually quite rare for us to have a student from the James Bay Coast communities or other remote communities in Northern Ontario. So we were approached a couple of years ago by the MasterCard Foundation, who was also interested in this problem, and they have a mandate within their foundation to train 30,000 Indigenous youth in a range of professions and came and asked what we might be able to do or suggest. We at Queen's have a long-standing relationship with MasterCard Foundation. They've funded some really important projects uh, that we've been involved in in areas like community-based rehabilitation in Africa, for example. So we sat down with the foundation and said, look, We've got this long-standing clinical partnership with, uh, with Moose Factory and with Waha. Uh, we think that we could actually expand that into an educational partnership. I am very happy to say, I'll spin things along to get to uh, the end of this story. I'm very happy to say that over the last year and a half, we have developed this project to the point that 
we have funding uh, from this very large philanthropic organization to be able to support health sciences education in Winnebago. It's not a secret, but it's not well known yet. Uh, we have been granted a $32 million donation from MasterCard Foundation to build this project to expand health sciences training in community. So the idea here is that those youth from all those communities along the James Bay Coast wouldn't need to come to Kingston to be able to get their health sciences education. A good portion of this project is dedicated to working with high school youth in those communities because we know one reason those Young people don't go into nursing or medicine or rehabilitation therapy is because they haven't had the prerequisites, the science prerequisites that are necessary. So this project actually starts with working with high school students. We have started that already. We will continue to work with high school students to introduce them to the health sciences and the health professions, make sure that they get support to uh, get the right uh, credentials that they need and have support for their applications to university. And then we hope potentially as early as 2024 to be delivering curriculum, which is not exactly the same as our curriculum. It will be an Indigenous informed curriculum informed by the, the Council of Advisors that will be working in the Winnebago area. But we should be able to be delivering both the Bachelor of Health Sciences and the Bachelor of Nursing Sciences uh, in that community in uh, hopefully within a couple of years, lots of work to do between now and then, and someday be able to deliver other programs, including medicine, OT, PT, and potentially others such as midwifery. So a very exciting uh, project that we think will be transformative. We know all kinds of stories of people uh, who didn't, uh, who became health professionals only because the education came to them. And one of the great examples of that is Dr. Elaine Innes, who is now the chief of staff at Moose Factory Hospital. She uh, is Moose Cree herself. She went into nursing only because the Northern College offered nursing education to her in that community. And then she only went to medicine uh, because she was able to get into the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which was much more accessible for her. So we believe there's uh, real merit to being able to take education uh, to where people are and that they will then be able to be, be the workforce for the future for those communities. Well, last but not least, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a snapshot overview to what we're doing in general in health sciences education. Um, and hopefully it kind of wraps all these things together. So we have a huge advantage here at Queen's. We have a faculty of health sciences where there is a school of medicine, a school of nursing, and a school of rehabilitation therapy. That makes this place ever so uh, much more likely uh, to be able to bring those schools and to bring those professions together. Most of you know that we traditionally train in pretty siloed environments. Uh, people come into their particular school and they, uh, they hang out with the people that are in their school. They don't really take courses with people in other schools and they don't really get to know uh, the people from those other professions until they uh, meet them on the wards and then suddenly are expected to work with people. And by that time, they're afraid to say that they don't actually understand what each other does. So the doctors don't understand uh, what the OTs do. Uh, the PTs might not understand what uh, a surgical nurse does, for example. So there's all kinds of examples of what that could look like in the misunderstandings of, of the different roles that we have. We have set as part of our strategic plan at Queen's Health Sciences to be radically collaborating in fact, we've set a goal for ourselves that we would like 20% of our curriculum to be delivered in an interdisciplinary format. Now, we're not totally sure what that's going to look like, but we're heading in that direction. So what could that look like? What if our MD program students took their anatomy courses with the PT students and the OT students? What if our Bachelor of Health Sciences students took courses with the Bachelor of Nursing Sciences students? This is not just a single one-off lecture in an interprofessional education project. This is taking an entire course sitting side by side. What if we sent our students out into their clinical rotations and their placements as teams of students? We got this idea in part from our really fantastic 
natural experiment that took place when we were invited to send teams of students to Northern Ontario as part of something called Operation Remote Immunity. We were asked to partner with Orange Air Ambulance and in the delivery of vaccines to uh, remote communities in the north. And I believe we sent in total about six different teams over time uh, to, to visit some of these remote communities. We had nursing students, medical students, residents, and there were paramedics on the team as well. And when several of us debriefed with these students afterwards and asked them, what was the best part of your experience working in the North? I expect to, expected to hear from them all the great things about the uh, cultural experience, how they began to understand Cree culture or OG Cree culture and how they had sat around um, uh, with the elders and, and learned from them. They did say some of those things, but the overarching thing that they learned and loved from that experience was getting to know the other professions. They were uh, billeted in, uh, in, in hubs uh, and, and went out to their spoke communities. But in these hubs where they stayed, we had nursing students and medical students and paramedics and faculty uh, members from both medicine and nursing, as well as uh, residents talking to one another, learning about each other's professions, discovering uh, that they have much more in common that they realize and asking each other about the skill sets that they had. So we're now working on trying to find more ways to be able to have placements like that uh, across the province to be able to make sure that our students understand one another. We believe that this will be part of how they will learn to work better together, uh, respect one another, that they will understand the scope of practice that is different, and that, in fact, uh, the students themselves will be the ones to say, actually, the best person to be able to provide care in this case is the physiotherapist or the occupational therapist, uh, and they will be much uh, more uh, adapt and adept at being able to task shift, which is uh, part of the big solutions to health systems writ large. So um, stay tuned on that one. It's a big, ambitious goal. Um, all of these are big and ambitious. We believe they're important and necessary. We have uh, been uh, working on developing them, looking for opportunities to partner uh, across the community uh, with the province and with the federal government to be able to make all of these into reality. So yes, we are in challenging times in health systems. No, we will not let this crisis go to waste. Uh, and I hope that uh, you have heard something here that will give you a little bit of hope. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or get any feedback from you now. Thanks very much, Jane. You know, I'm also navigating online questions and face-to-face -face questions, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Chris, okay, excellent. We're texting. <laughs> What really strikes me from the conversation in the panel, and Jane, what you brought up, what resonates with me is this path forward, but a focus on communities. So Duncan proposed as sort of what we need to think about is community needs, systems that address these community needs. And what I hear from you, Jane, strongly is this idea of education within communities. And really thinking about education for the system that we need, which we don't really think about often as educators so much. We're usually sitting here thinking about curriculum development, curriculum alignment, and really don't think of HHR and, and system level planning within our curriculum. So I'm, we may have a question, but I'm going to get you to, if you don't mind, reflect on that as well. You know, you've talked about your role as dean from a systems planning perspective. You know, what would you talk and tell other educators, you know, maybe not just at Queen's, but abroad, like what's our role as educators from a health systems and policy perspective? Well, those are great questions, Catherine. I think the one piece that I'll pick up on is your comments about community and how rarely uh, uh, we ask the community what they need and what they want. I think we're getting better at that. We know that, for example, most health organizations now have patient and family advisors in, in their uh in their uh, bo on their boards or in their advisory councils, but we don't necessarily look to the community to find out what 
the community wants. And I think that there's a real merit in being able to do that, to say what would be helpful to you. That's one of the things we are actually doing uh, now with the Lake Ridge Project is reaching out to uh, councils, to uh, community organizations to say, what would you like your health system to look like? Um, how would you like to partner with us to be able to make this uh, possible? And I think, as you say, just give, giving that lens to those of us who are educators to be able to, to go and ask those questions uh, as to what people expect. A little bit of that comes from the move towards the value-based care. And I know, Catherine, you're very interested in this as well. Um, we need to have much stronger metrics for what people expect. Uh, I'm really interested in these concepts like patient-reported outcome metrics and patient-reported experience metrics. I think about uh, the fact that uh, so much of uh, the rest of our lives now gives us an opportunity to provide automatic feedback where people will uh, text us after we've left the restaurant to ask us what our experience was like. I recently checked into a hotel and two minutes after I had checked in, uh, the front desk had texted me to make sure everything was fine in my room and was there anything else. And I was actually amazed when I answered them that I had something missing that before you know it, they had had solved that. Why don't we do things like that in healthcare? Imagine if we were that much more responsive. And as you left your at your uh, primary care clinic, you got a message asking what your experience is like and what could we have done better. So I think the more that we we use those um, methodologies, I think we've been afraid to ask the question because we've been afraid of what the answer is. But until we're prepared to actually get that feedback and adapt our systems uh, to be able to to do to provide the care that people need, we'll never get better. Those are good points, and we're actually doing some interesting work funded by Ontario Health and our OHT actually looking at patient-reported experience measures being sent out actually after each experience in primary care, so those are excellent, excellent points. I have a question from Zoom, so I'm getting a bit of feedback, so I'll stand out. <laughs> um, the question again is related to feedback, Jane. It says, have we asked the students themselves why they aren't choosing family medicine? And for those that graduate from family medicine residencies, why don't they establish practice in health teams or independent practice after they've trained to be family doctors? They likely hold many answers. And I know that some of the literature has said this to us, but what are your thoughts on that? There has been a, a quite a lot of work uh, done in that, and the um, Canadian College of uh, the College of Family Physicians of Canada has specifically uh, looked at that. Um, they've given answers along the lines of things that I've talked about. The administrative burden, and particularly filling out forms, uh, is one of the answers. They, they, you know, the uh, the data now shows that for. For family doctors, every hour that you spend in clinical practice, you can expect to spend at least a half an hour, if not another full hour, in doing paperwork after you've finished. Uh, and when you know when you finish your clinic at at four or five o'clock, and you're still sitting there at nine or ten o'clock doing your paperwork, it gets pretty discouraging. So those are all the kinds of things that we need to provide some solutions for. We think that there are solutions out there. There's some really interesting work being done with the use of scribes, and even with the use of uh, AI to be able to try to um, do some of the work of filling out forms. Uh, there's some interesting projects in that area. Um, so you're absolutely right. The, the students themselves will tell you exactly why they have not chosen to go into those areas. It's, they do not hold back. <laughs> okay, I've got another question um, from the Zoom. And if anyone else has a question, by all means, um, go up to the mic. I'm wondering what the opportunities are to partner and work collaboratively with the virtual platforms for primary care that have become that have been becoming more popular in terms of efficiency and accessibility. Are these options discussed as part of the curriculum or at the problem solving level as current as potential innovative current and future opportunities? So there's sort of two parts there. Um, the answer would be yes and yes and yes. I think there might have even been three questions <laughs> there, but all of these things are yes, these are part of the solution. They're not everything, right? So, you know, it's fantastic that we were able to deliver and adapt pretty quickly to the use of uh, virtual methods of care delivery during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, 
common knowledge that not every uh, particular clinical encounter should be done virtually and everybody has stories of, of adverse outcomes associated with the fact that in some cases those people should have been seen uh, in person. So there, this is an area that I know is of tremendous interest to governments, for example, to try to figure out, you know, how do we uh, make sure that people are making the right decision as to who needs to be seen. Uh, yes, it me is much more convenient and sometimes more accessible for people who have access issues. Uh, but if it means that uh, someone doesn't have their belly palpated or their lungs auscultated, uh, and they should have, then um, it, we will do people a disservice. So uh, getting that balance right is a big piece of work for us in the in the months to come. Mm -hmm. you know, great points. There's, I've got a few other questions from the chat. Um, is there a discussion, and this is a great question as well, um, and I know, Jane, you've alluded to the fact that we've got three, you know, four important disciplines here at Queen's, but this is re in regard to expanding the disciplinary set here. Is there any discussion occurring to look at other healthcare disciplines to make up the interprofessional model at Queen's. Your example of collaboration with Operation Remote Immunity makes me think of paramedics being included. Uh, well, thanks. That's a great question. I think that question comes from JD, uh, who is in, in the audience. He sent me a note that he was going to be there. JD is a, a terrific uh, uh, paramedic specialist and uh, has a particular interest and expertise in remote communities. So. Um, you know, uh, we are we have big ambitions at Queen's Health Sciences, and, I, and there's a lot of interest in new and expanding programs like paramedicine, like physician assistant, like midwifery. So if I if I listened to all the people, we would just do everything. Um, bit by bit, we are exploring other options of what Queen's Health Sciences should be doing. In the meantime, there's nothing that holds us back from collaborating uh, with disciplines that we don't necessarily train to. Uh, uh, and uh, I am a big, big fan of the role of community paramedics. Um, I think they are an essential part of primary care teams and not just the hospital-based systems. So um, there is work being done and stay tuned. We're not announcing any new programs yet, but we're certainly uh, exploring uh, and uh, having strategic discussions about uh, what we should do next. Um, Jane, I think that might be the last question. I don't know if there's any last questions from the audience. I'm just going to wrap up then this afternoon, really thoughtful discussions, both from the three panelists today, really thinking about, you know, what are the challenges currently in healthcare? And then really, we rarely think about education as a solution from HHR, even though it's the key supply, but we don't have these conversations about, you know, what are some innovative models and education policies that we can be thinking about in terms of innovative education for communities? I'm just going to remind everyone now.